Can I start? In it? It's, it takes a little bit to for everybody to join. So hello colleagues, we're just giving one minute for everybody to finish joining and we'll get started in just a second. Okay, okay. Go. we can go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, wherever you are connecting from. Uh, we would like to uh, bid you a very welcome, big welcome to the BOS, Business Operations Strategy High Impact Common Services webinar. This particular one is about inclusive HR, uh, attracting and recruiting of persons with disabilities uh, concerning job and advertisements and career fair. My name is Luigi de Munich. Um, I work for UNDCO that stands for Development Coordination Office. Uh, I am the regional coordinator for BOSS in Asia Pacific and uh, I'm also the regional admin officer for uh, all our RC offices in the region. Uh, before we uh, begin, we would like to uh, go over a few housekeeping items uh, just to make sure that we're um, being as inclusive as possible. I will first uh, give a brief visual description of myself. Uh, I'm a Caucasian male, um, dark hair, about 180 centimeters tall, average foot size. Um, I wear glasses, I have uh, facial hair, creative facial hair, uh, like many of us do. Hey, Lars. Um, I think that's it. Um, please know that this event adheres to the code of conduct to prevent harassment, including sexual harassment at the UN system events. Uh, I think Luis Diego will post uh, a URL on the chat. Uh, we, are, we also have uh, captions available for this event, which you can turn on or off by clicking the CC icon or clicking the ellipsis and en enabling transcription. As you can see uh, from your cameras, we also have a sign language interpreter available who will be signing uh, each and every word we speak. Please feel free to ask questions throughout the session. For that purpose, we have a questions and answers box and our team uh, will be monitoring this uh, and uh, attending to questions, sharing with everyone. We will also follow up with a document after the webinar and make sure that all questions are answered. So if your questions uh, are not answered in the event itself, 
uh, rest assured that uh, with this document, we, we will field this question and make this available to you. At the end of the session, you are also given the opportunity to raise your hand and unmute, unmute your mic and pose the question uh, via that way. Uh, last but not least, uh, the webinar is being recorded and we will uh, make this recording available as well as other uh, resources after the webinar. Does that include my part or also the, the next one, Luis Diego? Yeah, you can cover the agenda, Luigi, that would be great. Okay, uh, so in summary, this webinar will cover high impact service of inclusive HR uh, that concerns the attracting and recruiting of people with disabilities, um, also career fair and job ads, to support OMTs on how to collaborate to recruit and hire persons with disabilities, this webinar will focus on job ads and career fairs. Next week, we're going to uh, cover the topic of having an inclusive recruitment process, uh, looking at reasonable accommodation and assessment of HR practices. Uh, also, the next part is for me, right? The speakers? Yes. Okay. I would like to introduce today's speakers along with the agenda and the support team. First, we hear from Lars Tushuizen, the Chief of Country Business Strategies from the DCO, same organization as I'm from, who will be providing an overview of disability inclusion within business operations as a high impact service. We are also joined uh, by our friend Gopal Mitra, Senior Social Affairs Officers, Officer from the Disability Team of the Executive Office of the Secretary General who will be sharing about the UN Disability Strategy and the UNCT Accountability Scorecard. We also have on the panel Stefan Trommel, Senior Disability Specialist at ILO, who will be sharing an overview of inclusive HR practices and ways to implement this at country level. Further, we have Mr. Al-Raj Abdallah from the International Disability Alliance, who will share on how to work with organizations of people, uh, of persons with disabilities and supporting to engage people with disabilities. Last but not least, we also have Heba Kholeif, disability specialist, who will share her experience in organizing inclusive career fairs. Um, We'll also take a moment to thank and introduce the support team in the background, who's doing a lot of the legwork. Uh, before, during, and after this uh, webinar. First, we have the international sign interpreters, Natasha Parkins Maliko and St Stephen Serenzi. I'm sorry if I butcher your names, I'm terrible with names. Uh, we also have Sarah Falsi providing the CART services for communication access real time translation services. So that's what CART stands for. From the disability team at the EOSG and DCO, we have Georgia Dominic, Social Affairs Officer from the Executive Office of the Secretary General. We also have Brianna Harrison, Human Rights Policy Specialist and DCO Disability Focal Point. And we are also joined by Aino Efraimson, the DEI Specialist and Special Assistant to the Resident Coordinator in Nepal, currently supporting DCO. I think without much further ado, we give the mic to Lars. Okay, good morning and good afternoon, uh, colleagues. Um, as Luigi already said, my name is Lars Tussaus. I'm the Chief of Country Business Strategy in DCO. We handle the efficiency agenda in general for the Secretary General and Deputy Secretary General. Like Luigi, I'm also a Caucasian male, one meter 90 tall, at least I was this morning. Don't think I shrunk anything since then. I got blonde hairs and blue eyes, and also facial hair, as Luigi so nicely put it. It's gray, not blonde, it's gray, Lars. It's blonde, Luigi, it's blonde. Um, anyhow, um, so I'll provide you a little bit of a background and an overview of the of disability inclusion services. Um, as part of the efficiency agenda, we have, we have a tool or an instrument 
uh, that is now in 131 UN country teams. So it is uh, that tool is called the business operations strategy. So all UN country teams in the world have that have that business operations strategy in place. And what does it do? It is basically it identifies, analyzes areas of joint operational support to our program delivery in the country. So things that the, all the UN agencies in those countries, things they do jointly in the operational area. So on the program side, you have the UN Sustainable Development Cooperation Frameworks, UN SDCFs. And they are supported on the operational side by the business operations strategy. So these are the two strategies that in every country, all UN has. Now that framework has, has lots of advantages, um, but one of the big advantages is it allows us to scale specific services that headquarters and the, the UN SDG considered of, of very high impact. And of course, uh, that could be money impact, but it can also be social impact. So operational support services that have a social impact. And the disability inclusion services, they fall under that BOS framework. And we're using the BOS to scale this ultimately to all 131 countries. So it is a very powerful tool to get effective services, the things that work, actually to 131 UN country teams to really uh, create that change on the ground. So it is very much about projects. It's really about the change on the ground, the impact on the ground. So it's not about policies, it's not about documents, it's about projects that are being uh, implemented. So um, that's what we, a bit of the context of how we are positioning this. Can we, can we see the next slide, please? One more. So we, we're scaling high impact common services, it's not just disability inclusion, right? It is a, it's in different areas that we're focused. Disability inclusion is just one. The point of high impact common services is because we got these frameworks in, in all UN country teams in 131 countries, we have a, a very good amount of data. So we're analyzing the data to see what services really have a high social impact, uh, which could be uh, empowerment, which could be social inclusion. Uh, and I'll circle back to that in a moment or services that really reduce costs because we're doing things jointly rather than each agency doing it separately. So that defines high impact, it can be social impact and it can be money impact. Both of them are uh, included under the boss and scaled under the boss. Um, what we do is we basically, we, we design standardized services, so standardized service packages. So each country, for example, in disability inclusion, um, the UN country team say, okay, we're gonna do this. We're gonna include this. So how exactly are we gonna do that? So for each of these services, we have standardized practice notes, so we call them service packages. So there's detailed guidance available on how to do each step in that process, really focusing on the how. So it takes the, the, our staff by the hand uh, and shows them and helps them with actually making this work in that particular uh, country. As I said, disability inclusion is not the only one. It's the one we're gonna talk about today, but there is also other elements. It's about gender inclu inclusion, to give you an example, um, by designing your operations smartly, uh, for example, in gender responsive procurement, uh, you can use your, your procurement function to actually have a social impact by uh, channeling procurement efforts towards uh, suppliers that have gender policies in place, uh, equal opportunity policies in place. So you really use your procurement volumes uh, to have that gender impact. Now, of course, our procurement volumes are much higher than our program volumes, right? So if I have uh, maybe in a country as, a, as an agency, I can put half a million dollars into gender, but I have $10 million in procurement. So if I do 10% of that, channel that towards companies who have gender policies in place and female leadership and uh, gender inclusion policies in place, uh, if part of that can be channeled towards those kind of suppliers, you have a gender impact, a social impact, right? So that's another example of a, of a social impact services like disability inclusion. Another example is the environmental sustainability that focuses on renewable energy and energy efficiency and waste management uh, by the UN setting up these services and showing that it can be done. Not only do we reduce our own carbon footprint, which is nice because we are the UN, so we better lead by example, right? But the idea with all these three services is once the UN has it, 
our resident coordinators, our ambassadors, they will convene the government and private sector and external parties, and they will show how the UN uh, works on disability inclusion, how we uh, ensure that within our workforce we have people with disabilities. How do we work or use our procurement processes to boost gender equality and how we work on renewable energy and energy efficiency. So they show it to other parties who then incorporate this in their own practices. And we have had, uh, we have examples of Carrefour, which is a very large French uh, supermarket chain, one of the largest in the world, Coca-Cola. We have governments who say like, hey, I want this too. I want to support this too, but can you help us show us how you did it? So it is a two-phased approach for all these, these three services you see in front, of, in front of you of the social impact services. So it's very important that we don't just do this as a UN, but that once we are actually uh, have proof of concept that it works in the UN, that we bring this to the external environment. That's how you scale social impact. So to talk a little bit more about the disability inclusion, um, uh, for example, Luigi, can you go to the next slide, please? So disability, the disability inclusion uh, program has three components. And um, you'll hear in a, in a while, you hear Gopal and maybe Brianna as well, they'll talk about uh, the disability scorecards and different elements. Um, this one works in tandem with those kind of things like, like the scorecards. So the, the disability inclusion project has three elements to it. I mean, first of it is inclu uh, inclusive HR services. And as Luigi said, today we're going to focus on some examples in, in, that, uh, in that part of the project. The inclusive HR services focuses on, uh, or on increasing people with disabilities recruited into the UN. And historically, we've had some issues with it, even though we tried to push it, it didn't always go as fast. So this project has very specific means to boost local recruitment of people with disabilities. Uh, the second component is about digital uh, empowerment. So it is not enough to get people into the UN and recruit people with disabilities into the UN. Once they're in the UN, uh, you need to also uh, ensure that the tools and instruments are in place uh, for them to actually uh, maximize their full potential, right? So that includes digital accessibility, uh, people that are visually impaired or hearing impaired, that they actually have access to the same resources and can use those in their jobs just like anybody else. So that's the digital component of this. And then last but not least is the physical accessibility. So uh, for example, the, 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 the fact that you don't have um, uh, buildings with, with multiple stairs up front, the, the restrooms and such are accessible, that we have meeting uh, rooms on the, on the ground floor of the building when we convene, which the UN does a lot, that actually the, the rooms are accessible um, to people with, with uh, disabilities as well. So those are the three components under this project. Now, to this end, um, we've convened a partnership uh, working with private sector, uh, working also with foundations. As I said before, we have standardized practice notes that help the UN country teams to implement this kind of services. And these nodes have been co-designed with private sector, for example. So to give you an idea, we've worked with Amtrak and JP Morgan, who have large scale disability inclusion projects themselves. And we worked with their experts in tandem with our experts to actually design projects that actually maximize the impact of, of, of uh, these kind of interventions. So these are people who have also uh, a, lot to, a lot of value to contribute. So this partnership that was set up uh, operates under a board. It's completely framed around this project that you that um, that I just highlighted. Uh, but it's not just about the money. It's also about access to NGOs, INGOs, the networks in the countries. It's also about access to knowledge and networks, and of course, partially also access to financial resources. Right. Right now, we have 15 countries, 16 countries actually, that uh, are active. Um, we do not call them pilots. It's a proof of concept uh, because there's a concrete project. So we're testing that, this in different countries. All these 16 countries, uh, also thanks to the help of EOSG and Gopal and, and Brianna and the teams, they have received resources uh, to, to push this project forward. 
And it is also for us to test whether the, the practice notes we prepared, whether they're detailed enough so that everybody is, is it clear? Is this actually allowing them uh, to, to operationalize these projects and get that change on the ground? At the end of the day, the objective is to increase the number of people with disabilities working in the UN system and beyond. So not just the UN. So it is a very broad statement. Of course, the ultimate impact is about economic and social empowerment. But there's no reason why in many countries where, the, where people with disabilities are stigmatized or, uh, or do not receive the same chances that people without a disability get, uh, get there's no reason that we, these people could not be, uh, or people with disabilities could not be economically empowered on working and generating income uh, like anybody else. My personal dream, as I say in many webinars, I, prefer, I really look forward to the day that I walk into a UN building and I see drivers who have, have, have been heavily impacted by polio, where you have people with visual impaired, that are visually impaired uh, manning our uh, support functions, our reception desks, uh, because that's that's where we're going to start. I want to walk into a building and um, see economically and socially empowered uh, staff working, irrespective of whether they have uh, a disability, and that's very important. Um, and I think also once they you have the, the the recruitment pieces done and they are a productive member of the UN family. You also see that the, the economic empowerment breaks the social isolation, the social stigma. Uh, and that is the real objective at the end of the day of this, uh, of this program. So can you go to the next slide, please, Luigi? Now to talk a little bit about the HR specific services. So what, okay, great. We got this project document and okay, we know it's HR inclusive HR, but what is it really? What, what are the steps that we're actually pushing uh, forward? Uh, in order to increase uh, the number of people with disabilities in the UN, I mean, traditionally the UN always says like in its advertisements, people with disabilities are encouraged to apply. The same also women are encouraged to apply, right? That's how we often try to promote certain particular groups that we, we, wanna, we want to empower further and we wanna include. The problem with that is that in most communities, people with disabilities uh, either don't apply uh, either because they themselves don't believe they're good candidates uh, for this or have the necessary skill sets for this, uh, incorrectly assume that, but still, therefore, they don't apply. But also their environment in general doesn't stimulate them to apply for the same reasons. Again, it is, it is all about the stigma. One other problem is that for, the, for the many of the UN jobs, you need a master's degree. And when it comes to education, for example, again, that stigma plays out that often the investments in the families, uh, people with disabilities are not prioritized in that regard. So this project for now, as a starting point, focuses on those job levels. Uh, there, there are, I'm now half looking at Luis Diego, I think there's 11 job profiles uh, that don't require a master's degree. It's just to get it started because it's the, it's the lower entry point. This is not to say that in the future we're not going to expand it, but you've got to start somewhere, right? So it includes the identification and engagement of people with disabilities. If, if you recruit, it is not enough to, to have an advertisement stimulating people with disabilities to apply. So this requires local UN country teams to map out uh, local NGOs uh, or even international NGOs working with people with disabilities. Uh, so that we actually have direct access to the community we're trying to reach. Um, but that is even that by itself is not enough. So once you have the mapping done, it is, um, uh, it is important that when we have uh, vacancy announcements and job opportunities that they're channeled, proactively channeled through these different networks of NGOs and INGOs to ensure that people in the first place know that there's a demand for their services and that there's job openings available but also about training, uh, having uh, CVs, or we call them often P11s uh, drafted, but also that's also where the ICT empowerment comes in, having the tools for people to be able to do that in the first place, right? It's also about training and role-playing interviews. Uh, I myself have sat on several interviews um, uh, of people with disabilities, and often they are also, um, because they haven't been participating that much in the recruitment process, uh, often nervousness leads to the fact that they don't pass the interview. So this is another obstacle 
that limits the numbers of people in our people with disabilities in our ranks. So it is also about training, uh, getting people comfortable that it's okay, and giving them the pointers and the the, the guidance and the help. Uh, to successfully complete the interview process. And once it is actually completed, the UN's policies will do their work because according to our policies, other things equal, people with, with disability are prioritized to be recruited. So there's a much more proactive uh, approach to first off reaching people with disabilities, second off ensuring that they know that they are, uh, that these jobs are for them and that they are uh, uh, equipped to handle this and then helping them also to get through that process successfully. So this is a very different uh, approach than, than in the past. Now job fairs and career fairs, you're gonna hear more about that today, are a key part of a tool uh, on how um, you further boost uh, the number of applicants in, uh, in this regards. The end of the day, of course, the objective is to hire people with disabilities. Now, one point I really want to stress, which is very close to my own heart as well. Again, this is not just for the UN. I mean, once the project ends in the UN and hopefully that the, the practice is established for the years to come, it is the second phase for, uh, focuses very much on using the UN's convening power of our resident coordinators uh, and our UN country teams to convene the government and external parties and also show it off. Again, I, I, I often use the example of indeed the receptions being manned uh, by persons with a disability. Why? Because if somebody enters the UN premises, in particular in countries where the stigma is very strong, every person entering our building will get a certain message. The people with disabilities are as economically productive, as focused, and should be as socially empowered as anybody else. And every time somebody comes into our buildings or sees our drivers or sees our protocol officers or our other officers supporting, you get that message out. And that is important to, to break the stigma and get a behavioral change uh, going as well in the broader environment. And if companies like the government or Coca-Cola start doing this as well, and the UN is doing it, and other companies are doing it now, we're really starting to create these ripples of change that we're after. And the UN should play a role in that. We should actually play a leading role in that. Next slide, please. Oh, Luigi already switched it. Um, Gopal, um, all of this, I, I probably should have started with this, Gopal. <laughs> all of this is part of the United Nations Disability uh, Inclusion Strategy. This is the global, the corporate strategy. So this is part of that broader strategy. And uh, the expert uh, on our side, on that strategy, it's called UNDIS, UN Disability Inclusion Strategy. It's called Gopal Mitra, a good friend and a very valued colleague. So Gopal, if you can take over from me and talk a little bit about the UNDIS, that would be very much appreciated. Thank you. Enter, muted, currently unmuted, hold plus A button. Thank you so much, Lars, and thanks for your leadership and uh, for taking us to uh, the boss. And uh, it's been amazing to work with you, with colleagues in DCO, Brianna, Luis Diego, Zamir, um, I know, and so on. And Georgie and I really value this uh, this relationship. Uh, I'll be very short. Uh, as as Lars mentioned, uh, uh, all this, a lot of this work is happening under the umbrella of the UN Disability Inclusion Strategy which was launched by the Secretary General in June 2019. Now, it's, it's just three years uh, since uh, the strategy has been in place, and we are already seeing a lot of action. When the uh, Secretary General launched the strategy, he observed or he remarked that the UN should be, he would like to see the UN as an employer of choice for persons with disabilities. And that is the vision that he laid out for us while launching the strategy. Now to just give you, I'll be very short because we would like to hear from Stefan and Heba and, um, and Mr. Abdullah. Uh, the strategy covers both programs as well as operations. Uh, it covers uh, uh, both headquarters and the field. It, uh, it has a very concrete accountability framework, which consists of two components an entity accountability framework and a UN country team scorecard, which we are going to focus on today. Now, both these components have very, very concrete indicators. And uh, uh, Luis Diego, if you can go in the, the second slide, let me give you just a flavor of the indicators. Uh, 
so if you see there are 14 indicators uh, on the uh, in the un country team scorecard on disability inclusion and uh, uh, which are clustered under four core areas uh, leadership strategic planning and management how how our leadership country team leadership is championing disability inclusion how our the strategic plans and the cooperation frameworks address disability inclusion. There is a cluster of indicators on inclusiveness, which is which has two very fundamental indicators on consulting organizations of persons with disabilities, as well as accessibility, procurement, which, uh, which Lars mentioned, and so on. There is a cluster on programming, and there is a cluster on organizational culture which has a very uh, which has a specific indicator on employment of persons with disabilities uh, now all country teams are implementing the strategy and reporting on it annually from the from the data that we have we know that employment of persons with disabilities is an area where considerable work and progress is required and that is the reason we are so uh, 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 optimistic uh, that uh, the uh, the business operation strategy boss has integrated uh, common uh, uh, services on disability, including a specific uh, focus on on um, uh, human resources. Now, uh, as uh, just to uh, uh, begin where I started, if we have to be as the UN, as last mentioned, an employer of choice for persons with disabilities, our HR services have to take into account the different dimensions, the different aspects uh, that we need to uh, address in order to make it happen. And along with, uh, with, uh, with the work of our colleagues in HR, our colleagues in operations who are looking after uh, the physical accessibility of premises, our colleagues in ICT, who are uh, uh, looking at digital accessibility and so on are also critical, as well as our procurement. And uh, within all this, what is fundamental is to keep persons with disabilities at the center in terms of consulting organi uh, organizations of persons with disabilities so that we are doing stuff, we are doing things that will actually benefit and we are doing it in a way that actually uh, uh, is in line with persons with uh, what persons with disabilities want. We'll hear more about it, but let me stop here and hand it back over uh, the, so that uh, we can have uh, our substantive ex experts also present. Over to you, Luis Diego and Luis G. Thank you so much, Gopal. Um, I think that gives us a great overview. And now I'll hand it over to Stefan Tromel, also from ILO, Senior Disability Specialist. Over to you, Stefan. Yes, thank thank you, uh, thank you, colleagues, for the for the kind invitation uh, to this to this important meeting. Um, I um, I will also be rather rather brief because already many things have been said in, in particular also by by Lars with with a good number of examples. But I, I would start with a similar comment he made that um, although and I take the example from from the ILO. No? Usually, in all our job advertisements, both at global and at country level. We include a sentence in which we say that we welcome candidates uh, with disabilities, uh, but that is not always uh, or quite exceptionally leading actually to candidates with disabilities applying. Well, these candidates that uh, that have a visible disability or who sort of disclose that they have a disability. Having said that, it's still very important that we do that systematically. You know, that there is very often an expectation by person with disabilities that they are not welcomed to apply for any organization. So seeing that explicit re reference of being welcomed is, is, still, is, is still important and, and we should do it uh, for all types of um, positions. At the same time, it's also very important to, to add to that, that when they fill in the, the, the application form, we, we ask candidates whether they have uh, a workplace related, an accommodation that is required either for the interview, uh, and that's important during the process, and also to signal that if they would then, if selected, if they would need an accommodation in the, in the actual job, that that accommodation will also be provided by the organization. I think that that is an important additional information we should be providing to candidates with disabilities so that they really see that we, that, that, that we mean it. It's also important that we review very carefully the process, right? because there might often be inadvertently barriers for one for for persons with different type of disabilities in the process 
We need to look at the e-recruitment platform that we use in our organization. We have just uh, done a revision of our own platform. We have identified a number of problems that, for instance, a person using a screen reader would uh, come across when trying to fill in um, the, the relevant application forms. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, when uh, when it comes to the interview stage that uh, that there are no physical barriers for any candidate with disability that reaches um, that reaches that phase. We need to um, provide some basic awareness training to the people that would be sitting, for instance, on, on the recruitment panel. So, for instance, that they would be uh, able to communicate with a person uh, on the neurodiversity spectrum, person with autism, perhaps, who might not interact with uh, with the panel in in the way that the panel would be expecting might be an excellent candidate but perhaps he would he or she would not make it through because he or she is not exactly uh, communicating in in the way we, we we expect people to communicate but also important that the admin administrative staff that would be perhaps in contact with candidates with disabilities that they also are provided with some disability some basic disability awareness training so that they ask the right questions in a respectful way etc cetera, etc cetera. At least also in, in the ILO, we, we keep hearing that our medical form, and I think it's it's being used also still by some other UN entities, the medical form still includes questions which are definitely not welcoming, for instance, to people uh, with uh, with mental health uh, related disabilities, psychosocial issues. But there are questions in that form which we definitely should not be should not be asking. So first message: Let's carefully revise the process to to eliminate any sort of uh, barriers. That, that are there or, or issues that could lead to, to the feeling that I'm not, as a person with disability, I'm not welcomed in this organization. That might still not be enough, and definitely it's still not enough. We have the second challenge, which uh, is, is the outreach. How do we make sure that people with disabilities will knock um, on the doors of our, of our entities? My first suggestion is, or my first question would be, what are the strategies that we follow or that human resource departments follow to identify and recruit talent. Because what we need to see, to make sure is that in these processes, and it can be career fairs, we will hear about that later. It can be other processes, it can be outreach to universities. Um, for instance, in the ILO, we had, we had participated a few years ago in a, in a fair organized by Gallaudet University, the only uh, university in the world that is specific for, for, uh, for deaf persons. And we had a stand there to bring the, the ILO to the attention of the, of, the, of the global deaf community, so to speak. But there are many other strategies that uh, probably human resource departments follow. We just need to make sure that these strategies focus on persons with disabilities, include them, that they make them visible, that if we produce um, leaflets, materials of organizations, that these materials show women and men, show people from different, uh, from different colors, different backgrounds, but also show explicitly persons with disabilities all that uh, will show we will send a, an important message to possible candidates um, with disabilities it's also very important to reach out to organizations of persons with disabilities we will hear more about that in a, in, in a moment um, both at global level but i would say even 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 better at country level because uh, when we um, publicize positions uh, in the ilo at, for our headquarters yes we can send it to glo some global organizations but it's it's unlikely that that will 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 have a huge impact. But when we when we when we recruit people at country level in our office in in Kenya or in, or in Brazil or wherever, it is easier for our colleagues uh, to basically have a data bank of relevant disability organizations (OPDs) in that country or other organizations that would perhaps have a, a data bank uh, of persons with disabilities. And, and we should, so we really should should make sure that in whenever we 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 publicize a position, I would say every position. I would not sort of try to come up with um, with with this because there might be people for all levels of positions with all levels of um, of um, preparation, more basic or also um, much much more advanced, and really systematically send our job adverts to these different channels that would then hopefully reach candidates uh, with disabilities. Um, two last messages. Second last message is um, we also need to explore the different avenues. We need to somehow we need to build a pipeline of persons with disabilities that have the skills that our organizations are demanding. We can do that through um, 
junior professional officers, JPOs. We can do it by uh, selecting interns uh, with disabilities, by uh, making full use of, of the volunteer schemes that exist that also now UNDP and UNB are implementing. We can, uh, we can uh, involve in our work consultants, uh, short-term consultants, so that gradually we, we have a pipeline of probably mostly young, but perhaps also not so young, people with disabilities that gradually become more familiar with organizations and would then be better prepared to pass, let's say, the entry requirements um, for our positions, both at global and, and at national level. And last message is um, be uh, resilient and insistent. This is not something that will change from one day to the other. It will take time, but I think it's very important that we, um, that we continue and systematically uh, pursue this. Thank you very much, and, and back to you. Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, it's great to hear, and we'd love to, to hear more from you also in the Q&A. So for now, I would like to give the, the floor over to Mr. Um, Al-Rabi Abdallah, Disability Specialist at the International Disability Alliance. Mr. Al-Rabi, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much for hosting us, and hello, everyone. Uh, uh, this is Al-Rabi Abdallah from the International Disability Alliance. I will also be a little bit uh, brief and not to repeat, not to repeat uh, many points that have already been mentioned. Uh, just to start uh, with that, I do agree uh, that we still need to make this uh, reference that persons with disabilities are encouraged to apply because this really sends a message to persons with disabilities to raise their competency to apply and also a message for others employers that uh, as UN we are employing persons with disabilities and so on. And also I do agree that we need to mention about if, they, if there is any requirement for reasonable accommodation during uh, the interview and in the workplace after. However, uh, when mentioning that, I, I would propose that to make also clear reference that this will not involve any uh, like evaluation of the result or uh, just for the, uh, for the um, arrangement purposes and so on to make clear for persons with disabilities uh, to mention uh, the requirement and, and, and to see that uh, our organizations are welcoming even to prepare for them and so on. Uh, also one of the points that uh, always uh, need to think about, about the accessibility of the advertisement itself, like how the advertisement is, is written, we need to make it in multiple accessible format uh, for different, uh, for different uh, targeted persons to apply, including persons with disabilities and also about the application process, how the application process is simple and accessible. And, and, and this is really critical, the last point, because uh, in uh, some cases, uh, the, the complication uh, uh, of, the, of the process of the application lets some persons with disabilities uh, to give up or not to understand how to go with, just, with such a process given, uh, given uh, their uh, the barriers that they usually face, the layer 60 volts that they have, and so on. And, and, and the other point that I would like to mention, uh, reaching uh, organizational persons with disabilities is really critical for different uh, purposes. Uh, first of all, uh, for reaching out persons with disabilities so they can share uh, the, the advertisement uh, within their networks. They can target it a specific people from their uh, members that they have, that they know uh, they have this uh, profile to apply. And also they can help our organization on, to, uh, uh, on how to make uh, the advertisement accessible, how to change the format of the application, if there is a chance for that. So organization of with disabilities can help uh, reaching out and can help throughout the process to make it more accessible for persons uh, with disabilities. Uh, another point I would like to mention that uh, if, if just the main the points that have mentioned by Stephanie uh, about uh, having uh, a, a career a career growth for persons with disabilities within the organization in order for them to be able to go for other level and that uh, helps them to get a like better position and also help organizations uh, recruitment organization to have persons with disabilities uh, within the different level of the organization and also contribute to break the cycle uh, of the of the stigma that persons with disabilities work with uh, some prestigious organization and work not only in the lower level, they can work also in the up, uh, up and high level uh, within the organizations. Um, 
another point that I would like to mention, indeed having uh, some quota uh, within the within that baptized job, that will be good opportunities for persons with disabilities who have less exposure to be able uh, to get the job and to be able to come uh, like uh, be in this competition, indeed like applying with the unit uh, for the United Nations usually attract like high profession uh, and people have gone, have gone through a lot of exposure and so on. So to save some less for personal disabilities, quota could be useful in this regard. And, and, and the last point uh, is that uh, in order uh, for the United Nations, for us and for different organizations to have systematic approach, indeed that should be a part of the uh, policy of the organization, policy of the companies, I mean the all uh, mentioned above uh, measures from my side and for the other colleagues, we put that in, in the system and make it systematic, make it, make it part of our culture, part of our policy that will sustain uh, the, the, the interventions. And, 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 and just to, to conclude by that, organization of personal disabilities uh, can help in, in many aspects and, and, and uh, from the advertisement, even through the support that person with disabilities need through work, uh, during the work, pointing out like good profile, sharing, uh, helping on make things accessible. So uh, should also uh, be considered as a partner in, in the recruitment and, 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 and in applying such practices uh, within the organizations as that we are aiming uh, to be more inclusive for persons with disabilities. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Aradi. Um, great to hear from you from the field experience, experience from an organization of persons with disabilities. Um, I'd like to hand over to Heva Kellef, who is a disability specialist and who's supporting um, DCO on implementation of UNDIS and disability inclusion. Heva, we have about five minutes so that we can have Q&A. So I'll hand it over to you um, for a quick intervention. Over to you. Thank you very much, Lewis. I'll try to be as quick as I can. Uh, first of all, in order to attract and uh, recruit persons with disabilities, we have to take into consideration uh, internal and external factors. The internal factors uh, that persons with disabilities should have uh, the necessary uh, self high self esteem that uh, would enable them to have the courage to uh, apply and uh, uh, enter the uh, the. Uh, the uh, the labor the workforce of the United Nations. Uh, in order to do to do this, I think that by engaging uh, with organizations of people with disabilities, we can do um, uh, some uh, training capacity building measures uh, to build the youth the young people's capacity about self motivation and leadership and self representation, uh, advocacy skills and communication skills. Um, uh, and this uh, low self esteem that some people with disabilities might have is resulting from the stigma. Uh, that exist in uh, a lot of countries around the globe, especially in lower and uh, middle income countries. Um, uh, uh, this is the internal factors. Uh, the external factors, I think that uh, in order uh, for the UN organizations to attract persons with disabilities, they have to um, not only engage with OPDs, um, uh, but also engage uh, or uh, seek the assistance of uh, influencers who have disabilities like YouTubers and other groups on social media, uh, other activist groups um, from people with disabilities. I think this would be a great help to reach out to people with disabilities and uh, encourage them to apply for the, for, for, uh, to work in the UN. Um, also uh, holding career fairs, either for virtual or physical, especially in universities, and make use of the uh, the centers for people with disabilities uh, and the gatherings uh, for people with disabilities that are sometimes that that sometimes exist in universities. Um, this could really uh, help in uh, attracting persons with disabilities, especially if uh, there is a one-to-one uh, -one communication, because. Um, as uh, you might know, of course, uh, people on the autistic spectrum, autism spectrum might not feel comfortable uh, being in a big part of a big group and they might not feel uh, the ability to have the ability to co communicate. Uh, they, they would better be communicating on a one to one basis. Um, 
uh, and uh, when we talk about the career fairs, uh, of course, we have to take in mind uh, to keep in uh, to uh, uh, keep in mind the idea of accessibility and applying reasonable accommodation, not only in the uh, rec recruitment process itself, but also uh, in uh, in announcement job announcements uh, posts have to be accessible, whether it's in, on social media or uh, your own websites. Um, and also during the career, these career fairs, uh, there could be uh, uh, mentors uh, or job uh, job coaches who uh, engage into one to one conversations with persons with disabilities and assessing their skills and encouraging them to apply. Um, for me, for instance, uh, when I was trying to apply for a job in the UN, uh, what really uh, encouraged me to apply is that that uh, I was I got introduced to uh, um, uh, persons who were working in the FAO uh, when they were uh, attempting to do a web assessment uh, um, for their digital tools tools and their website. So this greatly boosted my confidence because. Um, uh, People with disabilities, uh, and I'm one of them. Uh, they have uh, less chances or less opportunities to go for interviews and being shortlisted and so on. Uh, so the whole experience of the recruitment process uh, sometimes raises the level of anxiety uh, to per uh, persons with disabilities, and I was one of them. Uh, so when I have someone uh, inside the organizations who uh, previously was introduced to my cap capabilities and capacities, that greatly helped me. Um, when I entered the the, the FAO uh, or any. Um, also, we have to consider the needs of people with hidden disabilities, especially in the interviewing uh, process. And if uh, there are some uh, written or oral exams, some people with uh, uh, on the autism spectrum might feel a little bit anxious when they are surprised with the questions that are present in the exam. So if there were like uh, mock exams or, or uh, there were sample questions on the UN or a different organizations websites for people to try to be to to try uh, as a as a as a training um, before entering or before uh, in, uh, yeah before enrolling in these uh, written exams that would be greatly uh, decrease their level of anxiety and make them better able to perform. Um, last thing I want to talk about is the society's uh, perception for people with disability and the societal, st societal stigma might really affect uh, uh, the people's disability expectation about themselves, um, the, the, especially in lower and middle income countries, women with disabilities are viewed as uh, incapable of holding jobs, uh, mostly protective uh, families uh, might uh, uh, decide to uh, make their girls stay at home. So, uh, uh, so I think if uh, the UN organizations would uh, collaborate with grassroots organization to hold community talks um, with uh, people with disabilities and their family, this would greatly, this would greatly motivate them to apply. I don't want to take uh, much time, uh, uh, more than I, more than uh, is located for me, but maybe at some other time uh, we can speak about re reasonable accommodations and uh, and other uh, topics that are related to recruiting persons with disabilities. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you so much, Heba. Really helpful, really useful, and we look forward to to working with you and working with the different country teams on implementing um, some of these initiatives. Um, so right now, we'd like to open the floor for Q&A. If you have a question and you'd like to unmute yourself, feel free to raise your hand and do so. There have been a couple of questions that um, the team has been answering throughout. There is one question that I'd like to address to, to Gopal and Stefan, and it goes about the linkages without, with the different um, streams of or different areas of disability. And it says, what happens if the office does not adapt to the needs that a person with a disability would have. So the office wants to hire, but it's not accessible in a sense for that disability. Over to you, Gopal. Uh, I will just start and uh, I think Stefan has a lot of uh, input, would have a lot of inputs on this. Uh, you know, uh, that's what, uh, that's why we say accessibility is a prerequisite for uh, inclusion. Uh, so uh, offices, most of the times will not be fully accessible. 
right? Uh, so, uh, for example, we have seen where a particular position that was hired was located on a higher floor, and uh, the the uh, then the workstation or the workplace for that person with disability was uh, located on the ground floor. Some adjust adjustments were made, and so on. Uh, there, uh, uh, to start with, it's not ideal to start with. Of course, as the office, if it takes a couple of months uh, to uh, uh, to uh, work on accessibility, it might also have uh, a remote working options. It is not ideal. People with disabilities have to be seen in offices. Uh, uh, but uh, as a as a first step to start with, during the the onboarding may happen. There are uh, flexibilities in that. In terms of digital accessibility, a lot of uh, the inaccessibility uh, can be. Uh, uh, addressed or uh, uh, temporarily at least uh, by by allocating or uh, uh, the, the person with disability to have a personal assistant to help. Uh, there can be volunteers who uh, among staff members who will support. So there is a host of idea uh, of, of ways in which uh, temporarily or to a certain extent, you know, accessibility is also a spectrum that it can be addressed. Um, and happy to, uh, of, of course, uh, discuss with the colleague offline because there is lack of time, but we'll hand over to Stefan because you will also have many ideas. Thank you, Gopal. No, well, just, just two messages. One is definitely, let's not wait for our, off, our premises to be fully accessible until we start employing because full accessibility that doesn't, doesn't exist. It's always a process. And let me just give an example. Our, our premises in, in Isle headquarters are reasonably accessible. But we have just recruited uh, in, as part of our team a first colleague, a first blind colleague who comes with an assistance dog. We've never had a colleague working with us with an assistance dog. We have never had a colleague working with us who needs some hours of the week for somebody to um, to read her documents and help her with PowerPoints and and all that. No, uh, we had to sort out a bit uh, how uh, if she, when she goes to the restaurant on her own, how, how will the restaurant staff. Uh, um, support her to, to find the, 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 the meal that she wants and get to the table and, and all that. We had to sort out a bit the getting from her, from her place to the, to the office, the transport system here is accessible, but still there were some issues. I mean, so it means we are a reasonably accessible premise, but you would, we'd still had to make some minor adjustments together with, uh, with Guler, our, no, our new colleague, to, to identify the solutions that best uh, suits her. No? And I think that that is my message. Now, let, let's not get I mean, if, if an office is extremely inaccessible, you can't even get into it with a wheelchair. Well, you have a problem if you're going to recruit somebody with a, with a, on a wheelchair. No, but let's not sort of um, say uh, we, we have to be fully accessible. All our staff need to be fully aware before we start employing. No, uh, the employment of persons with disabilities will help us to make our staff more aware and will help us to gradually improve the accessibility of our offices. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stefan, and encouraging. And, and that's one of the messages that we were giving. It does, you don't need to be in the final step, but as, as long as you make some progress and maybe you go from step two to step three, that is a huge gain and we can start moving towards that. We are out of time. I see, Heba, you have your hand raised, so I'll hand it over to you um, for the final comment. Uh, thank you, Lars. I was just wanting. I just wanted to say that uh, uh, COVID nineteen. One of the uh, positive outcomes of this pandemic, unfortunately, it's uh, it's an unfortunate thing. But having the boost in the online and remote work really uh, could be an opportunity for persons with disabilities to uh, enter the, uh, the many organizations like the United Nations. They don't have to be physically present in an office or a place if they have, if they, especially if they are in a low or uh, middle income country where transportation access is not, uh, uh, is not fully uh, present. They can just uh, work from home or work uh, or remotely. And uh, uh, that's, a, that, that, that's a huge uh, uh, window of opportunity that we can actually use in order to recruit more people with disabilities. Over to you, Louise. I'm. I hope you could hear me. Don't know what's wrong. We could. With my we could hear you perfectly. Yes. Thank Over you so much. You. We are out of time. Um, we want to continue emphasizing that there are a lot of resources, a lot of support to implement this. This is just one in a series of many webinars, and we realize again that it's a long journey, and just that you're not alone in it. And there are a lot of resources available. So thank you to all the speakers for joining. 
Thank you for the interpreters, um, the CART services as well. And we look forward to seeing you. Um, we have the same webinar on Thursday also, if you wanna join and next week, it will be the inclusive HR focusing on the recruitment process and making an accessible recruitment process as well. We will get back to you as well with some of the questions that you answered that we didn't have time to get to, but thank you so much for your, for your time. We know you're extremely busy and we appreciate your, your attention support and we look forward to seeing you in future webinars. Thank you very much.